is truth? Does truth even exist? We live in a society today in which your world and my world are not simply the same world from different perspectives, but yes, as it were, two completely opposite and competing worlds, or so it can seem sometimes. Is there such a thing as objective facts, objective reality, truth as opposed to falsehood? Or is everything that I can say true in some way? These are a few of the questions that we'll ex explore and ponder today as we open this book that I call God's Word, the Bible. We'll look at a story from the New Testament and we'll look at one of the Ten Commandments that deals specifically with this subject of truth. We'll see what we can find and see how we can answer some of these questions for ourselves. But before we begin exploring this beautiful part of God's creation, before we open God's Word, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for bringing us yet again to a beautiful place Lord, as we ponder your creation, as we ponder your word, as we ponder these important questions about truth and falsehood, Lord, I pray that you will touch our minds, touch our hearts, and Lord, help us to know the truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to come and explore with me as we talk about this important subject, the cost of truth. In the power of the Holy Spirit, the church was growing by leaps and bounds. Never had there been such unity, such zeal, such fervor in the hearts and minds of the believers. Sure, they faced obstacles, immense obstacles. Believers were being disowned, were being sent from their homes, their livelihood, their families, and all of their means of support failed them. And yet, and yet they banded together, and together they pressed forward in the power and strength of Jesus Christ. Those who had lands or possessions would sell their lands and contribute the proceeds to the common store. So the work moved forward in the power of God. But anytime God is doing something great, the devil loves to step in and throw an obstacle in the work. You know, selfishness is something that all of us have to deal with, each and every one in our own hearts and minds. There's always someone who wants to cheat. There's always someone who wants to gain the system. There's always someone who isn't totally converted, or even if they have been converted, who chooses in a moment of weakness to serve the enemy. We find this story in Acts chapter 5, and I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn there, and we'll take a look at this story, a sad story, and yet an important warning to each and every one of us. The story is told, Acts chapter 5, is of a certain man named, named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, who sold a, a possession, a piece of, prop, of property. It was totally their right to sell it or to keep it. No one was forcing them to sell it. And yet, and yet they chose to sell it and to make a pledge, a contribution, to contribute the proceeds of this sale to the common store. Those who did this, after all, were looked upon with high esteem. The same way it would be today if it was known that someone contributed large sums of money to the church. Wouldn't you expect that everyone would honor and look up to those people? So they agreed to sell this land and contribute it, the money, to the church. So they sold the land, and perhaps they got a little bit more for the land than they were expecting. After all, God had blessed in this transaction, for it was God's money. They had dedicated it to the Lord. And as they got home after selling this, this piece of property, they looked at this, this stash of cash. They said, wow. Um, 
What if we just keep a little bit of this for ourselves? After all, nobody knows how much we sold the land for. And so they did. But they kept part of the price back for themselves and contributed part of it to the church. They were very generous in what they gave to the, to the common store. But it wasn't everything that they had pledged. Well, as they came in, the, uh, the story is told uh, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 2, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? And he reminds him of what we've already said. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Certainly it was. It was theirs to do with as they pleased, except that they had pledged and committed to give it to the Lord. And now they pretended to give everything to the Lord. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? These are Peter's words. You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the story goes on to describe how a little while later, his wife, Sapphira, completely unaware of what had happened to her husband, comes in, Peter asks her the same thing. She affirms, yes, the land was sold for this price. And in, in, as the lie had barely escaped her lips, she herself, fell down dead, and was buried next to her husband. It's a story like, like we wouldn't expect to find in the Bible, certainly not in the New Testament. Perhaps it harks back to some of the, some of the difficult stories in the, in the Old Testament, about the, like the man who reached out his hand to steady the Ark of the Covenant as it was about to fall off of a cart, and he is struck dead in the process. Why would God, a God of love, strike down dead two people who were serving him yes perhaps with a selfish heart and yet and yet i think it speaks to this principle that we asked a question about in the beginning this principle of truth or falsehood we'll go on down this creek and see what we have to to explore as we explore this question and understand the value that God places upon the truth. Isn't it interesting that whether we speak the truth or whether we tell a lie. The world around us is a silent witness to the truth, just like the reflections here on the water. It may not be a perfect picture, but in those reflections, we can see an image of the sky and the forest above. I could, of course, take a photo editor and make this picture look as though I was standing on a beach or on the top of a tall mountain. But the reflections in the water would belie the truth. In the same way, the reflections within our lives and the world around us will eventually determine or tell to others whether the words that we speak reflect the truth or reflect a carefully fabricated lie. In the case of Ananias and Sapphira, of course we see how God stepped in and, and intervened in this situation in the, in the young church. But just imagine for a moment that he hadn't. Just imagine for a moment that Ananias and Sapphira had gotten away with their lie. Of course the church would all acclaim them as, as wonderful and generous members of giving all of this property and giving all of the money as they said they would to the church. And yet, with the portion that they kept back for themselves, what would they do with it? If they spent it and got some good clothes or some other good things for life, 
Certainly someone in the church would find out, and someone else would hear from them, where someone would go and, and talk to the people who bought the property and find out how much they paid for it. The word would get out, and soon it would spread from one to the next to the next. And pretty soon the church would know, hey, these people got away with cheating. And then it would be the next cheater, and then the next. And just like happens so often, yes, even today in worldly organizations, and yes, so often even today in the church, it would become corrupted with this, this note of selfishness, of self-seeking, of self-serving. And in this early stage in the church, God chose to intervene in a very dramatic way, a very shocking way to show his regard for the truth and that his word and his church was not to be tampered with. You know, virtually every society places some important value upon truth and the telling of the truth in our speech and by our conduct. After all, if our neighbors and us cannot be trusted to tell the truth, what is the purpose in communication at all? What is the meaning of our words if they do not have some representation in the reality around us? How could we have a court of law if everyone who testified could not be trusted in some way to tell the truth? And so it's not surprising that we find in the ninth commandment these words, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't bear a false witness. Don't tell a lie. Now, wh how do I extend this to not telling a lie? After all, the language, especially in the English translation, seems to deal with a court of law. If I'm taking someone to court or if someone calls me into court to testify, then don't testify falsely. We call this perjury. If I testify under oath that I'm telling the truth and then I tell a falsehood, that's perjury, that's lying. And certainly that would be breaking this ninth commandment. But the ninth commandment is broader than simply testifying falsely under oath. The Hebrew word that is translated false or false witness is a broad term that means falsehood or deception in general. It's not simply perjury. You know, it's interesting how these last six commandments of the Ten Commandments reflect the first four commandments in a different context. For example, we find that the fifth commandment about honoring our father and mother connects very strongly in its language to the first commandment about honoring God's name. The seventh commandment, for example, we talked about that, how it forbids adultery and, and provides for this exclusive relationship between a husband and wife. Well, isn't that similar to the first and second commandments that, that describe the parameters of not just a relationship with God, but an exclusive and jealous relationship that God has with us and he wants us to worship him and no other gods. Well, in the same way, this ninth commandment and not bearing false witness against our neighbor connects back to the third commandment and not bearing false witness against God. It says, do not take God's name in vain or do not take God's name falsely. And a very similar language we find in the ninth commandment, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't bear false witness about God. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 12 says, You shall not swear by my name falsely. You shall not profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. That word there in Leviticus 19 is the same word that we find for lying in the ninth commandment. You know, that's perhaps one of the worst ways that we could lie is to take God's name in vain, to bear a false witness against God. But God isn't just concerned about protecting his own name and reputation, as important as that is, because he repeats the same principle again, but this time 
in our relationship one with another, with another human being. But why is it so important for us as Christians to always tell the truth? I mean, after all, shouldn't there be some exceptions? <laughs> we'll keep going down the trail and see what the Bible has to say about that. Like I said, lying or bearing false witness isn't just something that happens in a court of law. As Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, the breaking of the Ten Commandments begins not in our actions or words, but in our hearts and our thoughts. Committing the sin of adultery, for instance, he says, begins with the lust in our hearts, the look with lust. Or the sin of murder doesn't begin with pulling out a sword, or in our case, maybe a gun, but with the hatred, the jealousy, the unchristian feelings that rise up in our hearts against our brother or sister. I think about the story of Jacob. In the Old Testament, we find the story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau and their parents, of course, Isaac and Rebekah. Now is that when they were born, in fact, God had made the pronouncement that the older will serve the younger. And as one day when Esau came in, you know the story, he was so hungry and famished, he asked his brother Jacob for a pot of lentils and his brother seizing the opportunity said, sell me your birthright for this pot of lentils. And he did. But even so, even so, the birthright still belonged to Esau, or at least so it seemed to his father, who, who really loved Esau. And as, as Isaac was getting old and had a hard time seeing or hearing, he thought that soon he would die. And so he called his sons to him, he called Esau rather, and said, go and, and find some some venison, hunt some venison and bring it back to me and I'm going to give you the birthright blessing. So Esau went out, but Rebekah had heard his father, her, her husband, telling Esau to go and hunt. And so she hatched a plan along with Jacob so that Jacob could deceive his father and steal the birthright. Jacob quickly went to the flock and slaughtered a, a goat, cooked some meat for his father and and dressed himself up as if he were Esau. And as he goes in, I don't know if he intended to actually tell a lie to his father, but the whole time he was acting a lie, he was pretending to be his brother Esau. But Isaac, though his senses were a little bit dull, suspected something was up, and he asks him outright, Who are you, my son? And Jacob, now caught in the middle of this acted out lie, now utters the lie, I am Esau. And he goes on to affirm again and again, I am Esau, and Isaac gives Jacob the blessing that he had intended for Esau. It seemed for a moment that Jacob had gotten ahead by his lie, but we find as the story unfolds, because of Esau's anger and wrath at his brother for stealing his birthright, Jacob had to flee. He had to flee, and the place where he fled to his uncle's home, in the land of Paddan Aram, his uncle cheated him over and over and over again. And Jacob never saw his beloved mother, Rebekah, again. Sometimes it seems as though we can get ahead by a little bit of cheating, a little bit of lying. But in the words of the 19th century Scottish poet, Sir Walter Scott, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. It may so seem so innocent at first. It may seem as though we won't even have to tell the lie. But, as with the other sins, lying begins in our heart with the intention to get someone else to believe something that isn't true. And so, we begin to deceive. And when we set our footsteps in this path of deception, 
we turn our hearts away from the truth. But as I asked in the beginning, what is truth? So what is truth, anyway? Is truth simply a collection of facts? Things that are true about the world we live in? About reality and life in general? I can say things like, the world is round. Well, obviously that's true, despite the fact that some may disagree with it. Or that the law of gravity dictates that if I hold something up and drop it, that it will fall to the ground. Certainly, these are elements of truth. But you see, facts sometimes change. What was true yesterday may not still be true today. What is true today may not be true tomorrow. And in addition to that, there are things that are true but that are impossible to know, or things that, though we know them to be true, are difficult or impossible to prove. So how can I know what is truth? You know, as a little diversion on this subject, the fact that we don't know everything that is true, I think should speak to us of the importance or the, the danger of telling even small lies. Now, I'm not saying that uh, I can never make a claim unless I know for 100% sure that it is factual and represents reality. But what I'm saying is telling something that I know is a misrepresentation, but I believe won't hurt anybody. Think about the story of David. He was fleeing from Saul, and, and he fled to the temple. He and his men had nothing to eat, and he asked the priest there um, to, to help him out, to give him some food and a sword. And he said, and this was the lie that he told, I am on a secret journey, a secret errand for King Saul. Now, what David didn't realize was that there in the temple that day was another man, Doag the Edomite who was a chief of the herdsmen for Saul. He was loyal to Saul, and he heard, he saw David come in, he heard David tell the lie, and he saw the priests there helping David. Now, the priests believed David. They believed that David was on an errand for the king, so they didn't take any measures to protect themselves, or they, 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 they didn't have any qualms about helping David and his men. Doag ratted David out. He went to Saul and said David was here. Not only David, but the priests, and because of David's lie, all of the priests lost their lives at the hands of the jealous king, Saul. Now, as I said, I took a little diversion there, but I was asking the question of truth. And if I don't know everything that is true, how can I be sure that I know the important things? How can I be sure that I know how to avoid the things in this world that may be damaging to me. You know, we're not the first person, people to ask this question of what is truth. When Jesus was on trial before Pilate, there, just before his crucifixion, the Jews were accusing him of being a king, of claiming to be the king of the Jews. And in John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate says to Jesus, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Truth has something to do with a relationship with Jesus Christ. But Pilate says to Jesus, notice these words, What is truth? What is truth? It's the question that we have been wrestling with all day today in this message. But Pilate, though he asks the question, it seems as though he has no time to sit and listen for the answer. He is so close, so close to learning of someone who will change his entire life. He has a privilege right before him, which thousands, yes, millions today and throughout history would have longed for, would have given anything for, to be in the very presence of Jesus Christ. 
And he is sitting there as a judge over Jesus. He asks the question, what is truth? And then before Jesus can give an answer, he stands, he turns to leave and give his verdict. But Jesus had already said, we find his words in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And he says again in John chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, brother and sister, when we know the truth, it's not just about having a knowledge of facts. Yes, we can know facts, but we can never know all of the facts. But you see, what's more important than knowing all of the facts is knowing one who knows everything. Knowing the one who knows the number of hairs on your head. Knowing the one who's promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And having that relationship with one who says, I am the truth. And when we have that relationship with him, my friends, when we have that relationship with him, he can speak the truth in our hearts. He can speak the truth to us through his word. He can speak the truth to us that we need to know. But just having that relationship doesn't mean I can sit back idly in a corner and ignore the truth. It means that now that I have a relationship with the truth, that the, for the rest of my life, I pursue a deeper and fuller knowledge of the one who is the truth and of what he has to tell you and me. When Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17, he used these words. He prayed to his Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And of course we know from John chapter 1 that Jesus is the word made flesh. And yet he has given us a word in written form. This book, the Bible, which Paul says is sharper than a two-edged sword. You know, so many times as Christians, it's tempting to think, well, I know about Jesus, I've given my heart to Jesus, so that's enough, isn't it? Why should I bother to study the teachings and the doctrines of this word? It might just get me confused. But friends, God has given us his word for a very important reason. Because in building that relationship with Jesus Christ, because we cannot see him in person, we take in his words by reading his book, by understanding the teachings, so that, as the scripture says, we are not deceived. Jesus says over and over again, be not deceived. The deceiver is seeking to destroy our souls, and our only safeguard is in his word. You know, right now, in this world, and part of the reason why I'm out here preaching in the woods and not in a pulpit in one of the churches that I pastor, part of the reason is because of this pandemic of coronavirus that is ravaging our country and ravaging our world. Even as we speak, people are getting sick, people are dying as a result of this disease. And yet you know that many people, even in this country, deny that a pandemic is even happening. People who are sick, people who are on their deathbeds, gasping for air because of the damage of the coronavirus has done to their bodies, are still denying the existence of a pandemic. And yet, at the same time, there may be a pandemic that is worse than the coronavirus, that is taking hold of our hearts and our lives, a pandemic of lies of Satan. And the only way to com combat this pandemic is through the Word of God and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Does it not seem just a little bit ironic to you that in our world today, where we have with the internet more access to information than ever before in history, that at the same time, there seems to be so much scarcity of truth, so much scarcity of, of an ability to have a certainty in what we believe, to have what we believe rooted and grounded in reality, to have what we believe rooted and grounded in a relationship with one who is the truth. As I asked in the beginning, 
How can we know the truth? And if we neglect to have that relationship with Jesus Christ, we go on the internet and we find people claiming just about anything and everything. I can find evidence for anything I want to believe, even if I want to believe that the earth is flat or any of a number of other conspiracy theories, I can find many people who will believe it with me, who will cheer me on, who will give me some kind of evidence to support my claim and my position. It seems perhaps that there's some power that is warring against the truth, that is seeking to create havoc among humankind. You know the Bible actually describes this. Jesus describes it himself in John chapter 8. In verse 44, he's speaking of the Pharisees and he's decrying their abuses and, their, and their, their claims of knowing everything when they know nothing. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Notice this, speaking of Satan, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So really you have two principles, two powers. You have the power of Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of truth. And then you have the power of Satan, who is the father of lies. You know, the very first lie that was told to the human race it was told in Genesis chapter 3 by that serpent, who was Satan, in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, he didn't tell the lie by presenting evidence to refute the truth. He simply questioned the truth of God's word. He said, has God said you will not surely die? Has God really said that? And then he contradicts God. He makes a claim. He doesn't, he's not able to refute the truth, but he causes doubt to arise in the mind of Eve. And with that, a covetousness, a desire for something that she doesn't have. Because of his lie, he speaks into the heart of Eve a thought that God doesn't mean what he says, a thought that God does not have the best intent for her. And because she entertained this thought, this doubt, she believed the lie. She took that fruit and ate. She gave to her husband, and he ate. And ever since, we as humankind have been subject to the lie of Satan. And yes, we perpetuate the lie to our brothers and sisters, to those within our circle of influence, until we surrender and submit our lives to the truth, to the one who is the truth, to Jesus Christ himself. But you know, in this world, it seems like the only way to get ahead is to tell a lie to fudge the truth just a little bit. It seems as though to follow the truth comes with a cost, sometimes at an immense cost. So what is the cost of telling the truth? For Ananias and Sapphira, that cost would have been giving the full purchase price of the land to the church. For Jacob, that cost would have been allowing his brother to have his birthright. Even standing up against his mother to do what is right, to trust the Lord to provide the promised blessing. For David, that cost would have been to tell the truth to the priest that he was running and trust the Lord to protect his life rather than telling a lie to the priests to get what he wanted or what he felt he needed for himself and his men. What is the cost of the truth? The cost of the truth is the picture of Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. Giving of himself to save you and me. Why? 
because we believe a lot. And yes, we see in the early church, we see even the apostles, the ones who had followed Jesus, the ones who had given their lives in order to follow the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, nearly all of them, giving their lives as martyrs for the cause of Jesus Christ. We see John, the one who wrote these words that we've been studying. We see him, yes, suffering a martyr's death, as tradition tells us, being thrown into a vat of boiling oil, and yet God miraculously preserving his life. When his enemies could not kill him, they banished him to an island, a deserted island of happiness. But there on that island, the Lord Jesus Christ came to him and revealed to him more of his truth, revealed to him special messages for his church who would carry his church through to the end of time. You see, friends, living the truth is about living in that relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he speaks into our hearts through his word, through his law, through his commandments, and yes, through his Holy Spirit. The truth today, tomorrow, and for all of eternity. Friend, which will it be? Will you live your life in this world always searching but never coming to a knowledge of the truth? Or will you be willing to surrender all of your plans, all of your ideas, yes, to make the sacrifice, to pay the price in order to have the relationship with the one who is the truth? That is my prayer, friends, that you will choose the line, that you will choose that relationship with Jesus Christ over everything this world has to offer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, in this world there are so many things vying for our attention. There are so many different theories about the truth. There are so many who claim to have the truth. But Lord, we know from your word, we know that you are the one, through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord. May we come to you through Jesus. Lord, may we give up all of the deceptions, even the ones that we love to cling to, and commit our lives to that truth. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.